So this talk is going to be about how constraint programming can be used to generate um, logic programs, and I will in particular focus on probabilistic logic programs. A common example of a probabilistic logic programming language is Problog. Um, and a common example um, of a program in Problog is called Smokers. Um, you can see how the structure of a program is basically the same as in a typical logic program, but we also have probabilities attached to classes. And whenever we query a ground atom or a ground formula, instead of a true or false answer, we get a probability in return. Um, probabilistic logic programming has been used in many different fields, um, with a lot of applications in robotics, natural language processing, also cancer diagnosis um, and data analysis in biology. Um, a lot of inference algorithms have been proposed, but whenever a new algorithm is uh, is proposed for inference in probabilistic logic programs. Um, it's typically only compared to other algorithms based on a couple of programs, often just one program with slight variations in between experiments. So this work is supposed to fill, fill, the, fill this gap and allow um, people working on inference algorithms to to test their algorithms on a wider range of problems. Uh, in the full version of this talk, I will describe uh, the main aspects of the constraint model uh, that we use to generate programs. Um, I will give a brief introduction into inference for probabilistic logic programs and, um, and show what kind of conclusions we can draw from applying a random program generator to inference algorithms. So if we have um, a program like this, um, what kind of parameters should this model have? What kind of characteristics of this program uh, describe um, its constituents? Well, we have predicates and each predicate is associated with an arity. Um, we have variables, constants, probabilities, the number of clauses in the program, and uh, the, a measure of complexity of a clause, or rather the body of the clause, which is often a conjunction of literals, but can be an arbitrary formula. Um, so we can represent an arbitrary formula like this as a tree, um, and then the measure of complexity is simply the number of nodes in the tree. And we, and we can represent a tree like this as a table with two rows, where the second row lists all the values of each node, and the first, um, and the first row encodes the parent relationship. Each cell holds the index of, of the parent node. So the disjunction node is seen as its own as its own parent. It's also the parent of negation and conjunction, whereas the parent of p of x is at index one, and that's the negation node, and so on. We have efficient constraints um, that can constrain this table to be to represent a forest, and we can add additional constraints to turn it into a tree and to make sure that each tree gets a unique representation as a table. Um, another important component of, of our model is the predicate dependency graph. This is a graph where we have a node for every predicate. And for example, we draw an edge from friend to influences because we have a clause where influences is at the head of the clause and friend is mentioned somewhere in the body. Um, the first reason to care about this graph is called stratification. Um, 
It is a condition that both logic programs and probabilistic logic programs need to satisfy um, to make sure that they have a unique, well-defined answer for every query. We can classify all edges in this graph as either positive or negative, depending on whether the corresponding clause has negation or not. The original program didn't have any negation, so all of the edges here are currently positive. But if we were to add this additional clause, this would create a negative edge from smokes to friend, and this creates a cycle with at least one negative edge. We call them negative cycles. And it's we can it's easy to intuitively see how this disrupts um, the semantics of the program. If, if the probability of friend increases, then the probability of influences also increases, which increases the probability of smokes, which decreases the probability of friend. So we want to avoid cycles like that. And there are a couple of simple graph theoretic algorithms that can detect cycles although we currently don't have any propagation for this constraint. So we simply detect a cycle when, whenever it occurs and discard that program and look for other programs. Another reason to care about this graph is predicate independence. This independence can be understood as independence in the underlying probability distribution, or informally we can think of it as the predicates friend and stress are independent if um, the way we calculate probabilities for friend has nothing to do with the way we calculate probabilities for stress. Um, so suppose this is an unfinished program where we're still considering adding more clauses that, that would create new edges in, on this graph. The way we make sure that this independence constraint remains satisfied is by identifying the, the ancestors of, of both nodes, both friend and stress, including themselves. And then we can notice that um, we can't have any edges from any of these nodes to friend, because that would make person into an ancestor of friend. And um, this would make stress and friend dependent. So we can explicitly discard all of these edges from our constraint model. Um, similarly, we can't have any edges going from any of these four nodes to either person or stress, because that would make friend an ancestor of stress. So we can also discard all of these edges as well. So this kind of propagation can remove a lot of um, a lot of edges from this graph and simplify um, looking for solutions um, to the specification of, of a program. The first set of experiments we ran investigates the scalability of, of, a, of a model, how it scales with higher levels of values. The first thing to note um, is that um, the computational bottleneck seems to be the, the maximum number of nodes in, in the tree representation of a formula, the complexity of, of the clause. Um, other than that, the, the, the model scales well enough to, to generate programs similar to the kind of programs that are typically used uh, to test inference algorithms. Um, moving on to inference, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of inference algorithms have been suggested. Most of them do some kind of knowledge compilation, where the program is compiled into a diagram, and, and inference is performed on that diagram, and it is expected or, or provable that inference is faster on the diagram. Here I listed a couple examples, and we also have approximation schemes like KBEST that um, can be combined with any compilation scheme. Here are a couple examples of, 
of diagrams for a simple propositional formula. Um, the diagram for the negation normal form is directly corresponds to the original formula. The DDNF expands the formula, but it does so in a way that um, the, the diagram satisfies some additional constraints that, or some additional properties that are supposed to make inference faster. Um, to reason about the BDD encoding of, of, of a formula, um, for each variable, in order to see how whether the formula is true or false for a given parameter values, we follow the solid edge if the variable is set to true and the dashed edge if it's set to false. So we can see that the formula is true if A is true and C is true. And for example, it's false if A is false, B is false, and C is false. For SDDs, um, each rectangle should be read as a conjunction and each circle should be read as a disjunction. So the top part of this diagram can be read as A and C or not A and the formula encoded by this subgraph. So we have all of these compilation schemes and algorithms and now we get to compare them on a wide range of uh, programs. To do that, um, we split each program into two parts, facts and rules. Facts are generated um, with a simple, um, with a simple um, guess and check model, where we generate random values, check if it's in, the, in, in our selected set until an added to, to the set if it's not, um, until the set reaches the number of facts we want to generate. Facts. Facts don't have any variables and they have empty bodies, um, whereas rules have variables and usually non-empty bodies. Both facts and rules um, can have, may or may not have probabilities and um, and we use the constraint model to generate the rules. The first thing to note is that um, all of the inference algorithms behave very similarly and the differences are somewhat minor. Another um, quite expected observation is that as we increase the number of facts, inference time tends to increase as well. Um, a more unusual observation is that independence doesn't seem to affect um, inference time at all. So the x-axis on this graph shows the proportion of pairs of predicates that are said to be independent. And a good way to think about independence is that if we have a program with eight predicates, all of which are independent, so we're looking at a point somewhere in this region, then for any given query, seven eighths of the program um, can be completely ignored. They have no way to influence the answer. And yet that doesn't seem to make inference any easier. Uh, we also looked at um, the maximum arity of any predicate, making sure that this arity is actually achieved. And programs with higher arity predicates tend to be um, more difficult to reason with, but not by much. We also varied um, the proportion of facts in the program that are said to be probabilistic, that is, their probability is not equal to 1, and more probabilities in the program also tend to make inference uh, slower. To summarize, um, with this model we can generate um, programs of reasonable size that are similar to the kind of programs typically used to compare inference algorithms. 
the main performance bottleneck of um, of the model seems to be the complexity of the clause or the number of um, nodes in the tree representation of a formula and this can be overcome by for example restricting the program to a simpler format Res namely restricting um, the body of a clause to be a conjunction of literals as is commonly done anyway um, this work opens up a lot of open questions uh, for the future for example if we're generating random instances um, can we generate them from a well-defined probability distribution uh, there is previous work that shows how to uniformly sample from the solution space of a constraint model it remains to be seen whether it is efficient enough to be applied to this model um, another major question is how come all of the algorithms ended up behaving so similarly and more specifically um, why doesn't independence predicate independence make inference any easier finally the implementation of the model in Java using the constraint solver Choco is available on GitHub.